cast your ballot hope for the best Good evening. My name is Bahman Yazdanfar and this is Voters Echo for Tuesday, 2nd of the February 2016. Uh, this show come brought to you weekly to uh, uh, introduce different perspectives of our social and uh, political environment and what we are facing. It can help you the next time around when you are in the ballot box uh, to cast your vote uh, more informatively. A couple of disclaimer, I am under payroll of no individual, no corporation, no union. I am neither member or sympathizer of any mainstream political party, provincially or federally. I do not get uh, paid for this show at all. Uh, the airtime for this show is uh, donated by Dr. James Sears, which I appreciate in advance from him. And by the way, mentioning Dr. James Sears, he is chief and editor of the satire political newspaper and uh, coincidentally because it is first of the beginning of the month very soon you will have a, a copy of his uh, recent uh, your word news uh, on your mail and those of you who are not uh, living in the areas that you receive this paper on uh, by via Canada Post you can access that online on your word news website uh, it is very interesting, not necessary. I agree with everything it says, and probably some of you uh, don't uh, uh, like uh, some of the languages, but it is good to know that how other people think and uh, write. Now, we, today we, we have a very interesting uh, topic because many Canadians, uh, as well as uh, new immigrants, uh, they are not clear in the distinction between the immigration, citizenship, and the refugees, and the laws and acts pertaining that. Today we have online someone who has been through this uh, process, and we're mainly talking about citizenship acts of Canada tonight. Uh, Don Chapman is with us. Are you, uh, on, uh, are you hearing me, Don? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, can you introduce yourself with your full name and a little bit of your background for our audience so they know who they are listening to? Well, my name is Don Chapman, and I'm the head of the Lost Canadians, and my web page is lostcanadian.com, which is singular and lowercase. Uh, I was born in Canada, in Vancouver, in 1954. I am about a tenth generation Canadian. Both sides of my family are Canadian, my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. But I was stripped of my citizenship in 1961 due to nothing that I did but convoluted and archaic citizenship law. Now, I became an airline pilot with United Airlines, and it always bothered me that I could be, uh, that I was a citizen of a country that I'd never vowed citizenship to, yet I wasn't a citizen of my own country. And like an airline pilot, I wanted to know why. We want to know why a plane crashed. So I looked into the citizenship laws, and we discovered some horrible, horrible things in Canadian citizenship law, and the wording was, and this is the exact wording, married women, minors, lunatics, and idiots will be classified under the same disability for their national status. Married women were property of their husbands, children were property of the fathers if born in wedlock, and mothers if born out of wedlock, so when I was six, our family moved from Vancouver to Seattle, and my father took out U.S. citizenship. Since I was born in wedlock, I was his property. Canada ripped up my citizenship, and apparently Canada made thousands and thousands of children stateless. So I've worked very hard to correct these laws. I've been the force behind seven bills in Parliament, uh, both originating in the House and some in the Senate, to correct this legislation. We've retroactively restored citizenship to upwards of one million people, which is very significant for a country of 35 million people. What you don't know in citizenship law can hurt you. And unfortunately, the laws of identity in Canada are so convoluted uh, with amendment after amendment that it's become a barnacled creature that just keeps growing more barnacles to the point where no one is actually certain who is or who is not a citizen of Canada. And lastly, 
with my pilot background, I wrote a book called The Lost Canadians, A Struggle for Citizenship, Identity, and Equal Rights. And I wrote it with and through the lens of an airline pilot wanting to know why and how. How could this happen in a country that purported human rights? And it is amazing because you would never in a million years get on an airplane with a pilot who didn't know how to fly an airplane or who had never flown before, yet we keep sending people to Ottawa and they get involved with citizenship and these members of parliament don't have a clue. So it's the blind leading the blind and we're trying to go forward to put more legislation through to completely revamp Canadian citizenship uh, or, uh, in Canada with a new act that would finally make the Canadian Citizenship Act Charter compliant. To date, it is not. So that's who I am. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, that is Don Chapman uh, via Skype. Uh, unfortunately, because of technical problem, we couldn't have uh, uh, her uh, camera, uh, sorry, his camera working. And this is the book uh, in my hand, uh, The Lost Canadians that is available in the bookstore if anyone wants to uh, find out uh, more uh, or read more about this matter. Our next guest, uh, our second guest, is uh, a returning guest, John Richardson. John, uh, you called me a couple of days ago and you mentioned this is a, something that it has to be addressed. Can you elaborate on what Don says and uh, how it uh, impacts you? You, are, you were born, unlike Don, you were born the other side of the border and then you Im immigrated or became a Canadian citizen here. Can you just elaborate on that so we have seen the both side of the coin? Well, sure. Um, it, well, you know, I was up in Ottawa on Friday, walked into Indigo, and um, saw the book, The Lost Canadians, and uh, I, I think I'd seen Don's site uh, somewhere in my travels anyway. And uh, I'm going to put in a plug for the book. I mean, I think it's a fascinating book. Uh, but what it really is, I mean, I think Don has exactly right that it's not only... Canadian citizenship law, but certainly American citizenship law, is unbelievably complicated. I think that uh, as far as citizenship laws in both countries go, uh, if you could imagine uh, an outdated website where they try to tweak it here, tweak it there, uh, and it's, it's, it's simply awful. Uh, I mean, certainly the point that Don makes about the inability uh, that a lot of people have to determine whether they're Canadian citizens or not is exactly the same thing. Uh, for uh, people who at the present time because of the fact of stuff are accused of being American citizens in Canada. But what the book really uh, I think is about, I mean I've, I've read most of it, but really it's about I think the 1947 Citizenship Act. Yes, you Canada send me the link. Uh, yeah, uh, yep. which, I, which I have in my hand and um, you know, I think that to some extent it's, you know, it's the result of trying to create a brand new citizenship law uh, almost out of nothing. Uh, in 1947, a number of British Commonwealth countries, including Australia and that, were going through the same process. Uh, I mean, look at how small this piece of legislation actually is. I mean, it's remarkable. Like 10, 12 pages. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable uh, by today's standards. Uh, but, I mean, it does say uh, some incredibly uh, interesting things. And, uh, you know, I mean to put some legislative context into what Don is saying, uh, Part 3, Section 16 of the 1947 Canada Citizenship Act basically says this. One, that if a Canadian citizen becomes a citizen of another country, will contextualize the United States, he or she loses a Canadian citizenship. But it goes on to make the point that, uh, as Don did, that the, uh, the children, all right, you know, would follow the status of the parents. The same as they, what happened to Don. Yeah, and well, I'm I'm just explaining exactly yeah. exactly what did have happen to him. So, you hey. know, and this is partly in the context of uh, of a political culture, I think, in North America at that time that uh, disallowed that did not allow dual citizenship uh, in general. Uh, but I mean, you know, being sort of a student of citizenship law, I think it's very very interesting to. Uh, compare the relevant U.S. legislation at the time, which did not result in the loss of citizenship uh, for sure, but gave the, the child the opportunity to assert uh, you know, in, a, in a positive way. Um, and, and this was true in Canada as well, but the language wasn't quite as strong. So really Don's book, I think, is about uh, the Explaining problems of the, the 1947 the, uh, Citizenship Act. Uh, Don, uh, are you a Canadian citizen right now? 
I yes, I got it back. It was restored retroactively, but I come from the hardest country in the world to get into Canada from. I come from Canada. I was born in Canada. I was born in wedlock, and I was not adopted. No, no, and I realize that I, the the fact that you have to uh, to fight back to get what you uh, entitled to originally. Yes, it oh. took me forty-seven years to get my citizenship restored. Forty-seven years. Yes. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Don. I have a question. Was that was that the result? Was the restoration of your citizenship the result of the 2009 amendments to the Canadian citizenship law? No, but I was the person behind Bill C-37, um, and there's a good and a bad side. I did not want the second generation born abroad issue to be put into it, but the the bill that you're talking about. Uh, I had qualified as an immigrant, so I went through the entire immigration process, as did my family, and I was given my citizenship in um, March of 2009. The bill became effective in, on April 17th of 2009, which kind of is ironic because it was the, uh, what, the 36th uh, anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms or something. 37th, yeah. 37th, yeah. Uh, uh, Don, uh, if, if, based on your uh, uh, your experience and the experience you went through to do that, uh, uh, how do, what do you contribute this matter that within, let's say, between 1940s, let's say, let's we put at least 30 years for, let's say, up until 77 or 74. In last 40 years, what do you contribute that nobody, no, none of the political parties or officials addressed this issue? That was very interesting because Libby Davies, who was the deputy leader of the NDP one time in committee, looked at me and said, how come nobody has ever briefed anyone on this from the bureaucracy? Well, it is something that uh, the 47 Act did not create Canadian citizenship. And so uh, the 47 Act was basically a, a political grandstanding by the then head guy, uh, uh, Paul Martin Sr., and uh, um, the Prime Minister, Mackenzie King. And uh, so they, they, they did not tell the truth on Canadian citizenship back then. And so it's just kind of made its way through for the last 70 years to become, oh, that's what happened when it did not. Our history is wrong. So when you base a lie, you kind of, things get convoluted over the years. So it just has gotten to the point where no one is aware. The bureaucrats don't know. The, the one consistency about CIC is that they're inconsistent. The politicians don't have a clue. Uh, I mean, even to the point where Romeo Dallaire, an icon in Canada, he was stripped of his citizenship. He had no idea. And, uh, and here he is, a sitting senator and a former general. Um, it, it is just amazing. But, um, and, and, and right now, I could take anybody. I could take the Prime Minister of Canada, the previous Prime Minister I was in court against. They had no idea. I mean, they're flat out saying that citizenship didn't exist before 47, and they're wrong. Uh, and uh, and uh, I want to add uh, to uh, to place this question for both of you, Don and John, as well. Uh, we, we live in a country that, at least since 1982, when the charter passed, and uh, the uh, the uh, phrase of the multiculturalism uh, became uh, like a fashion of the uh, our country since uh, at the time of the Trudeau and on. How come this has, uh, has not uh, even brought up by other people till you come across or a couple of people like yourself? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, um, you know, you use the phrase, uh, the word multicultural, and that is in the Charter of Rights as an interpretive aid. The Charter specifically says that the, it should be interpreted, uh, recognizing that Canada is a multicultural society. But the way I experience citizenship problems, once people have them, is there's no such thing as a small problem. They are absolutely massive problems uh, for the people who are affected by this sort of thing. And 
Looking at both Canadian and U.S. citizenship, I find it interesting that, uh, to its possible credit, um, the United States does include a def has a constitutional definition of citizenship, and there are constitutional uh, restrictions on somebody being stripped of their stripped of their citizenship. Of course, at the moment, there's plenty of people who are trying to renounce it because of the FATCA stuff and that. But I've always found it interesting in Canada that there is no constitutional definition of citizenship. In other words, there's nothing in the Charter of Rights, for example, that says that somebody born in Canada is a Canadian citizen. To me, that suggests that with all the attention to people's perception of rights and that in 1982, nobody really focused on what uh, one U.S. Supreme Court judge once said, citizenship is the right to have rights. Uh, so, frankly, uh, I think that it is just that, uh, you know, if you're not aware of it, uh, no reason to think about it. And if you do think about it, it is so incredibly complex because people have a tendency to pick up a book and say, what is the citizenship law of today? When in reality, the question is, what was the citizenship law at the time of the event? Uh, or the definition of that. Yeah, you know, or something. And it's, it's Di incredibly complex. And Don? Oh, uh, without uh, a doubt, John is absolutely correct. The first Governor General of Canada, right after the British North American Act and Confederation, made the announcement in 1865, in Canada we have just created a new nationality. And there is something. What's the difference between nationality and citizen? And um, in Canada, the enumerator instructions for the census uh, going back to, uh, I believe it was 1921, they said that the word citizen, nationality, and Canadian all meant the same thing. And um, the first real definition of a Canadian came in the 1910 Immigration Act, which was not so much about who was not a Canadian, but who was a Canadian. It just had a funny name. And then in 1921, there was the Canadian Nationals Act. And there are all kinds of um, upholdings of citizenship in the Supreme Court with the Chinese in 1938, the Japanese in 1946, the Supreme Court ruled that it was okay to strip them of their Canadian citizenship. Well, how do you strip somebody of something that which does not exist? Um, right now, the government's saying none of our war dead were Canadian citizens, or at least the Harper government. But John is right uh, when he says about the constitutionality of citizenship, um, these are all gray areas. And uh, the, when the charter passed in 1982, all laws were to become charter compliant within three years. It is still not charter compliant, our Citizenship Act. So that's something we're trying to press for to, I wonder, to make uh, it something that's really important. And, and uh, uh, John, uh, go ahead and then I ask you. Uh, yeah, actually, Don, you know, you, you've, said that, you've said that twice, and I've, I've seen that in your book about the, you know, the issue of citizenship laws not being compliant with the Charter. And, uh, you know, my discussion with you on the weekend, you know, you, uh, you know we talked about the uh, Benner case and, and that. But uh, I think it would be interesting uh, for people watching this to hear you elaborate on in what respect or respects uh, do you view existing Canadian citizenship laws not compliant with the Charter? Well, they still have a gender bias to them. Uh, more on the retroactive side at this point, uh, the Benner case was to restore gender equality in citizenship law. And for example, I just uh, had a gentleman yesterday uh, email me and then phone me and he is going to finally be offered his Canadian citizenship but his denial was based on the fact that his mother was the Canadian not his father he was and born abroad he was born abroad yeah but this is going on right now well that's not gender equality uh, we have problems in the Indian Act still where the Indian Act and the Citizenship Act you know coincide and then uh, we ju it's just, well, I guess the only way I can describe it is such a hodgepodge mess, as you said, that uh, when you get that way, it's subject to interpretation by each individual CIC officer. There are no clear-cut rules.
And there, and, are, and there is no really good training in citizenship law either. No, there is not. You're absolutely correct. So what you had is the recommendation for both Bill C-37 in the House and in the Senate, both the committees agreed that we needed a new citizenship act that was charter compliant, that was easy to understand, and someone could look at it and very quickly define if they belong to Canada or didn't belong. But uh, that is not what we have right now. Uh, and John, uh, we, I, I have two questions uh, based on what you just said. Uh, the first one is a little bit uh, disturbing for me because I'm an immigrant 30 years ago I arrived to Canada and uh, and uh, although I I'm just Canadian but I have seen many other immigrants or other newcomers uh, either refugee status or immigrants just straight immigrants they managed to keep their dual citizenship from other countries and many countries even are not in the approval list of their government how uh, how anyone from government uh, explains this discrepancy between the person who was born here and his father just chose to just travel somewhere else has to be a strip out of his citizenship in compared to someone who comes here at the age of let's say 30 or 35 and manages to keep two passports from two countries which one of them in many cases are not even appro approved the country <laughs> by the standards of Canada um, again, the, the, the laws are not charter compliant, so Bill uh, C-24, which was passed into law last June, uh, allows Canada to strip citizenship away from dual citizens. Well, what if you're not a dual citizen? What if you just happen to be a citizen of Ireland because your grandfather was Irish? Or if you're Jewish and you have the right of citizenship in Israel, there is a resounding discrepancy between people with dual citizenship and without, and that's a charter question. Further, we are creating stateless children whereby Canadians can have a child born overseas and that child is not a citizen maybe of any country. We've already produced that. Uh, so how can you have uh, some rights going to some people and less rights going to another group? These are questions that uh, need to either be tested or better than that why waste the money in the courts when odds are we're, we already know the answer just rewrite the citizenship act and make it charter compliant or at, I, uh, I would agree or, or, with you or, or at least just a definition of citizen in Canada well, there's there's actually two there's two there's two points here. first is I, I absolutely agree with Don that and I'm not and I and beyond Canada beyond the United States in a global world I think that there has to be clear definitions of citizenship, number one. But also, I think that there need to be constitutional protections uh, against people being arbitrarily stripped of citizenship. And this is what I think, um, you know, was a great, great oversight, uh, you know, in the Charter of Rights. Uh, you know, with all the problems. Uh, with U.S. citizenship, which at the moment are absolutely appalling and extreme, at least uh, the Fourteenth Amendment guarantees citizenship, you know, to, to certain kinds of people. And uh, John, uh, the second question that I have: uh, prior to uh, to Charter, Canadian Charter, we were under BNA Act, and uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, it's supposed. To, uh, to override that within three years, which we haven't <laughs> in the last 30 or some, something uh, years. Uh, I want to play a little bit of devil advocate. Is it by intention? No, I don't think it was intentional, but when you bring it to the government's uh, attention, then it becomes an intentional. So, for example, I was in court with the Harper government last year, and in response, to our court case, which is now dropped because of the new government, um, they did a couple of things. Uh, one with Bill C-24, they took a lot of rights away from individuals to challenge the government through the court system. They had also canceled the, ch uh, the court challenges program, which doesn't help the average person. But by canceling 
their right to challenge the government took power away from the courts and put more power into the hands of the prime minister. The second thing is he, uh, Harper's statement or the government's statement was that citizenship is a product of statute and has no meaning apart from statute. Now what that means is it's whatever the current government de jure says it is. Now if the Tea Party in the United States were actually in power and as John says, they didn't have a constitutional right down there of citizenship. No one can tell me that the Tea Party wouldn't be canceling Obama's citizenship. This is scary. We no, no, they'd to... argue he never had it. Well, that is questionable by itself in the first place. Uh, Don, as a matter of fact, another ex example is a candidate for a Republican. Uh, Mr. Cruz is a boy, was born in Canada, and, uh, and, is, uh, and already he has been uh, under fire because of the... Uh, his, his citizenships. Well, he was born in 1970 at a time when they did not allow dual citizenship. So he was, in a way, we could say he was either Canadian or he was U.S. We have discovered, and, and my expertise is not in U.S. citizenship law, but we believe we found a provision in the U.S. Supreme Court that did allow him to late, later register as a U.S. citizen through his mother. But again, that would be subjected to U.S. Supreme Court rulings, not Canadian. So my point there would be maybe he's not even a U.S. citizen if that's the case. But I think he is. Uh, is he a naturalized U.S. citizen? I would guess the answer to that is no. But again, the only one that can tell you that for certainty is the U.S. Supreme Court. My point was mainly be from the protection of the Constitution. If the Constitution of the United States indicates very clearly in black and white, you must born in U.S. soil in order to be a president. But it doesn't. It doesn't? No. What, what it says is this, that um, a president has to be a natural born citizen. Now that's not, that would include somebody born on U.S. soil. But it would presumably also include somebody who was a citizen from birth under U.S. law, perhaps, uh, as the story goes, with him born to a U.S. citizen mother outside the United States. The, um, you know, up in, in 1970 when he was born, uh, I mean, the United States has never been wildly enthusiastic about dual citizenship. but. What a U.S. passport would have said at that time, I believe, would have been that, on the one hand, uh, we consider that if you become a citizen of another country, it's an expatriating act. On the other hand, you know, uh, we do recognize that as a matter of simple fact, dual, citizen exist, dual citizenship exists. So, presumably, Cruz's position would be, one, obviously, by being born in Canada. He was, according to Canadian law, Canadian citizen. I understand he's since renounced it. Uh, really too bad. It'd be nice to have a Canadian citizen as President of the United States. <laughs> well, uh, that is right, but, but we, don't, we don't have that definition but he's got, here neither. But he's <laughs> got, well, that doesn't matter because he's not here. Yeah. And then, you know, so, he, so he's just getting the, uh, the U.S. citizenship through his mother. So presumably, uh, presumably he was a dual citizen and presumably I mean, this is a question that came up with John McCain, who was not born on U.S. soil. Uh, it was a question that came up with former Michigan Governor George Romney, who was yeah. Mitt Romney's father, who I believe Mexico, was born in Mexico. Mexico yes. So, I mean, this is something where, you know, it's something, I think it's a distraction. I think yeah. it's something that your political enemies pull out of the hat, they yeah, aim at you, but it has but, real But you meaning. said the language is not necessary, it means you were born inside the day. Clearly not, the, clearly not. Uh, Natural uh, born. Don, uh, after all of these, uh, 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 as a result of all of this uh, pain you went through, and uh, growing pain, I might add, uh, uh, what would be uh, what would your uh, suggestion be for, for the officials in Canada in this regard? What well, would what would I, be the easiest way? Let me put it this way, or more practical way. Well, one time the Senate uh, in the Senate testimony they asked me a similar question, and I said, well, the first thing they need to do is apologize, correct it, meaning right. Uh, better legislation and then go on with life. There's not much you can do. I mean, the, the injustice is already done. And it's not that I want to live uh, constantly uh, 
mad at everybody. I'm thrilled to be a Canadian citizen. But, uh, you know, people learn from their leaders. And if the country just buries this thing and doesn't fess up to it, that's wrong. And we have a lot of people still in kind of a gray area. The Mennonites. Uh, there was a deal about uh, second generation born abroad had to reaffirm their citizenship by their 28th birthday. Well, when they did Bill C-37, they left a four and a half year window of people saying, well, sorry, for everybody else, we're going to correct this law, but not for uh, a four and a half year window. And that zapped thousands and thousands of Mennonite children that are living in Canada. We also have uh, children of lost Canadians who got citizenship uh, through the immigration process, like my children. Well, all immigrant Canadians are supposed to be deemed to be born in Canada for purposes of passing on citizenship, but they didn't do that. They took that away, but only for children born uh, to lost Canadians who got their citizenship through the immigration process. So there are these little wacky laws in there that's, that need to be cleaned up. And uh, it would be better for Canada. I mean, my goodness, we're going into our, is it our 50th, or rather 70th, or our 150th birthday? If there were no citizens, how do you celebrate 150 years with no citizens? So um, I kind of contend that the elder Trudeau brought Canada the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The newer Trudeau could bring Canada its identity. And uh, what a wonderful thing to do for a country and we could have our shared values, so it's not just English and French values, but our multicultural values. Well, you are very optimistic. I am not, unfortunately, as optimistic as you are. But before I ask the John, ask you a question, uh, uh, it's very interesting you mentioned, uh, you, you described this last uh, couple of sentences. I want to know, do they apply the same law for the children of their ambassadors outside of the country when they uh, give birth to their children? Well, that was a problem, too, is that you had children born on Canadian military bases overseas that were, had their rights taken away from them, as you had with the children of the ambassadors and so forth, and people working in the embassies and consulates. Bill C-24 was to correct that law. But believe me, Left out some other get people. caught in the bureaucratic fishnets down the road, as yeah. sure as can be. Uh, it, it's very interesting. They have apologized uh, from Japanese or indigenous people a couple of times for different uh, uh, atrocities that they done, but yet uh, the simple citizenship has not been uh, rectified. John has a question for you. John, yeah, Don, um, while you were talking, I was reminded of something. I was leaving through your book today. This is actually on page 201, if anybody's watching. Um, go here. But you're describing, you have here a sentence that says, here are CIC's previously hidden, hidden methods of canceling unsuspected Canadian citizenship. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a great summary here. So partially fixed with uh, Bill S2, but, you know, currently known. How many of these things are still true? Uh, I, I'll just I read think, the list and you can tell me. I think me. we have about three. I'd have to go back and look through them, but I think we have about three of them left to go. Uh, why don't I read them and you say, uh, has it been fixed or not? So, you're foreign born and on your 24th birthday were not domiciled in Canada. That's fixed, isn't it? Yes, it is fixed. You're a war bride who never became naturalized. Fixed? Fixed. You're a war bride's child who never became naturalized. If you were born in wedlock, fixed in 2009 with Bill C-37, they kept the discrimination alive for people born uh, prior to 47 and out of wedlock. That was fixed this last June. However, even though it's fixed, we have a lot of people that are still waiting for Citizenship and Immigration Canada to issue them certificates of Canadian citizenship. Therefore, they are Canadian citizens, but they have no rights of citizenship. Okay. Don, would it matter whether they applied on Tuesday as opposed to Thursday? <laughs> it depends on it depends on who you get as a case processor. Exactly. It, okay. It's like having a winning lottery ticket, but you can't collect. How about this? In certain circumstances, your connection to Canada came through a woman rather than a man. Well, that's uh, it works both ways on that one. As you know, with the Benner case, uh, 
Benner was a gentleman born in the United States in wedlock to a U.S. father and Canadian mother. And uh, he uh, was uh, denied citizenship because the connection for him to Canada was through a woman rather than a man. And the Supreme Court ruled that was unconstitutional. You mean then, a married woman. In, in the OJ case was the exact opposite. It was somebody born out of wedlock to a Canadian father and foreign mother. And so the OJ and Benner decision said, hey, if you're foreign born, you have the right of Canadian citizenship of either one of your parents was a Canadian. Now, when I testified before the Senate and said, well, I was born in Canada, so that doesn't apply to me, so I'm not Canadian because I was born in Canada. Had I been born outside, I'd be Canadian. Every senator sat scratching their head saying, this makes no sense. And the Director General of Citizenship and Immigration Canada, Patricia Burkett, came in the next day and said, we didn't like that ruling um, of the Supreme Court, so we're going to cancel it. And on August 14th, 2004, we're going to go back to discriminating based on gender. And so, yes, there's an inherent gender bias. And when they passed Bill C-37 and C-24, they kept the discrimination alive retroactively. So we still have people being denied based on gender. So we have discrimination. Can they cancel the Supreme Court? Uh, no, Supreme? no, I, I don't. You know, we were talking about this on the phone on the weekend. I don't see how in the world uh, the government how can, can decide they, do they want that? to limit the application of a Supreme Court decision. Maybe Don knows something. Don, well, no, how, no, how can, no, how they, can they, they uh, can't. Over override the Well, they, uh, well you, you mean they can't do it legally. I mean, as oh. we know, the, I mean, the whole purpose of a charter of rights is because government does all kinds of things it shouldn't be doing. You know, that, that's the point. But listen, um, you know, this, uh, this Benner case is extremely interesting because one of the things that, that I do is help uh, uh, U.S. citizens manage to renounce, and one of the issues is whether they were a dual citizen from birth or not. And one of the issues there, I've worked with a number of people who were born outside Canada in wedlock where the uh, mother was the Canadian citizen and not the father. And I think that, they sh that those people, if anybody's listening, should know that that Benner case uh, ruled that that distinction was unconstitutional. Therefore, they were, in fact, dual citizens from birth and therefore exempt from the U.S. exit tax. Jo John, could I just make one comment on that? Mm -hmm. It gave you the right of citizenship, but the only way you could actually prove that you were a Canadian citizen was with a certificate of Canadian citizenship. And if you applied before that August 14th of 2004 date, then you got it. If you applied after that date, CIC turned you down and said, no, you are not a dual citizen. You're not, you have no rights in Canada. Now with Bill C-37 and C-24, you're back to having the rights. Right. So yeah, as I understand the situation now, to make it even more simple, to use another favorite example would be the Quebec border babies. Uh, so you're born in the United States because of a more convenient hospital. You immediately come back to Canada, never knew about the requirement to register your birth abroad. And you can help me with this, Don, but I believe the amendments of the Canadian Citizenship Act now mean that the registration was no longer necessary to be treated as a Canadian. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, the, the one problem there, and this gets back to Citizenship and Immigration Canada having discretion on these matters, there was the Clark family of Manitoba. That's exactly the situation you just described with the Quebec border babies, except they had, I think, four children. One became a drug dealer. So three of them... Uh, the, the other ones became lawyers? He, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, three of them were outstanding citizens. Oh. So the government decided to recognize three of their citizenships, but not the fourth. So really, citizenship and the Benner case ruled that the government does not have that discretion to decide who gets to belong and who doesn't. We're all part of the Canadian family. They're good people, there are bad people, but the commonality is we're part of the same family called Canadians. And, and by the way, John, your, your issue is really disgusting of the U.S. side. They're doing nothing more than a money grab to people that were you know, totally innocent in Canada. Oh, absolutely. And it's amazing I that mean, government it's, it's, it's Canada has It's an absolutely vicious. People.
brutal assault uh, by the Obama administration on Canadian citizens resident in Canada. Well, uh, just a uh, just a uh, one question, uh, maybe be either of you, either John or Don. Uh, be there was a clause on BC 51 that if uh, the, someone is being convicted of the uh, touristic thoughts or something like that, he or she can be, be stripped of the citizenship regardless of where he or she was born. Uh, do you know anything about that part? Or am I wrong John, about John, that? John, you want me to take it or do you want uh, to take well, it? Why don't we both take it? You go ahead. And go go we'll ahead, Don. Don, you start. Well, they have said that you could be stripped of citizenship, and I think that's very wrong. The Benner case was, I mean, it, Mark Benner was a convicted murderer, and the Supreme Court said, he, regardless of that, he's still a Canadian citizen. So what do you do? Do you strip a, a somebody who's a terrorist of their citizenship and then send them back to become a terrorist again in another country, or do you put them in a Canadian jail? I suggest that the answer is really screen your people better when they come into Canada. And uh, I hate to say this, but once a Canadian, you should be always a Canadian. And that was Paul Martin's words back in 1947, and the government hasn't exactly lived up to it then or now. I think John, that may have been think? Justin Trudeau's words in that debate with Stephen Harper, uh, a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. Well, probably he learned it well. from his master, uh, Paul Martin, Jr. <laughs> yeah, this is this is, an ex this is a really really uh, interesting problem. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ted Cruz um, actually proposed an amendment to uh, the section of the U.S. nationality statute that governs loss of citizenship, where he basically tweaked it to include um, you know anybody who uh, you know is associated or is a terrorist by presumably by Ted Cruz's definition of terrorism. Uh, you know, should be should be stripped of U.S. citizenship, and I think that what this stuff is is a recognition that citizenship uh, really can be used as a weapon that governments use against people. Uh, I mean, certainly the United States uh, has a history of stripping people of citizenship. Now they have a history of forcibly imposing it on people who don't want it. Uh, both Canada and Britain uh, are now fa falling into what I believe is trap of, you know, using citizenship uh, as a way to get people out of the community, sometimes the political community, and that's unbelievably dangerous. I mean, it reaches the point where governments can, you know, I mean, why, why, why not, for example, so the Trudeau government now has a majority, why don't they simply pass a law stripping everybody who's not a liberal of their Canadian citizenship. Well, well, John, you brought up an excellent point. Not only uh, is that very scary, it, it's amazing with the media in Canada didn't touch this one, and I've been in court against the Harper government on this very subject for the last several years. But the point you made was the definition of a citizen uh, or a terrorist, according to Ted Cruz. You're right, because now all of a sudden all the abortion doctors would be terrorists, as far as he's concerned. Uh, that is really, really territory you don't want to tread on. Um, what is the definition of a terrorist? There, I mean, right there, you could get many different answers to that question. And, uh, you know, the Tea Party might say uh, that anybody who's not a Tea Party member is a terrorist. Who knows? You can't let uh, something as precious as citizenship be uh, in a volleyball match to the party du jour to decide who belongs and who doesn't get to belong. No, uh, you know, absolutely. I mean, this is, again, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that these issues, these issues are completely invisible to people unless they've been directly affected by it. As a, as a matter of fact, one of my objections last year when I read uh, uh, Bill C-51 was in every bill, like uh, any legal document, at the beginning there is a, a table of the definition. And there was no definition, uh, there is no mention as terrorist and its definition. I did not see a definition for terrorism. So that, that is open, uh, it is as you done, uh, done as you and John, as you said, 
I came from a country, I was, I was born in a country and I studied in another country, which both were under just force of the, the rule, rule of the enforcer oppressor, at then and now. Yeah. And, and in, in all cases, anyone who does not agree with me, therefore, is like a George W. Bush. Either you are with us or with, uh, you're with the enemy or with the terrorists. You're either uh, with us so or you're So you can with the use terrorists. this kind of the ambiguity in the law or the act to, uh, to segregate or de make a divisive uh, effort to, to get people separated, and therefore you can just pass them through the calendar. Yeah. You, you, know, on you are absolutely correct. I happened to be in the New World Hotel in Hong Kong when Junior Bush made that statement. I was a pilot for United Airlines, so it was my company who lost two planes on 9-11. I don't have any kind of love for terrorists. However, that said, John uh, is absolutely correct, and uh, Bauman, you are absolutely correct. You cannot just leave it for the discretion of a politician. Period and full stop on that one. If you look at the uh, the Ted Cruz proposed legislation, which I, personally I think is nothing but political grandstanding, um, but what these statutes typically do, and this is on the question of you know who or what is a terrorist, is they make reference to some other law, right? You know, terrorist defined by so know, and so whatever. Or, yeah, and that's normal. And you know, basically, I think that uh, there ought to be an absolute ban on stripping people of their citizenship. Uh, you know, do other things. I mean, there's everybody's subject to the same criminal laws, but you know, essentially, to strip somebody of citizenship is to uh, remove all the rights they have to any uh, to be able to play any part in the process of democracy to affect the way the you know the, the uh, country runs. Uh, I, I want to bring a, a little bit uh, maybe a little larger scale question maybe I want uh, I want a little bit help uh, rather uh, because it's very difficult for me to digest uh, when we look at the policies that we are uh, facing globally we see a, 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 a very a speedy movement to, toward the globalization and one world governments like conspiracy terrorists uh, they call them but nevertheless new world order and uh, global treaties suggest that we are uh, governments at least in the G20 or or uh, industrial uh, countries they are trying to go toward a one world government doesn't this stripping the citizenship and say separating people from different uh, countries contradicts that mission Don well, well, am I a little bit off my head? I, I, I'm, I'm not for one world government, and I'll tell you why. It reminds me of the stock market. I don't want all my eggs in one basket. And you, as a pilot, I always prepare for the worst case scenario. So I look down the road and say, well, what happens if you have, uh, let's say, a modern day Nazi party get in? You know, I, I want my checks and balances. So I don't mind having more than one voice at the table and more than one government and that's just me no no i understand that but what i'm talking about it from perspective of people who the politicians that they are governing these countries they are claiming that we are going with all of these three uh, treaties like tpp and all of these uh, additional uh, treaties like north american treaty or nafta and so on they, they are, they are, they, it is their claim that they want to have the uh, uh, more centralized government el around the globe. I mean, but they are contradicting themselves by using the laws like uh, citizenship uh, laws that they are stripping people from their own countries and throwing to another country. Okay, in that regard, I'd answer it this way. Uh, first off, Canadians are not very good at knowing their identity. You can ask somebody and say, you know, are, are you Canadian? What's a Canadian? And they kind of will think about it, and oftentimes they'll say, well, I'm not an American. Yes, I don't. I know what you're not. <laughs> I drink beer and I, I love hockey, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to know, what are you? Okay, my last name is Chapman. I come from the Chapman family. I don't come from the Jones family. And we're not all in the same neighborhood of the same family. We all, hopefully, will complement each other, but I... I 
am not the greatest fan of, uh, let's say, everything with NAFTA and all world economies. And the example there maybe is the current stock market. When a smaller country like Greece can almost take down the entire world financially, I don't know that that's the world's greatest idea. It might be the idea of the day right now, but I, I like the idea that I am Canadian. And uh, that's my identity, and I don't want somebody who's never even stepped foot on Canada's soil to start defining who I am and who I am not. That's great. John, what's your thoughts about that? I mean, legal, I don't, I don't, well, first of all, I, I certainly agree with Don that I mean, I don't, God, I don't like much of any governments, let alone one world government. Um, but I think that, that basically... So you are you, terrorist you, then, by their definition? No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, I, I do comply with the laws wherever I live. Um, but I think that the... I mean, we're talking about sort of policy and the direction the world should be moving. It should be moving towards more individual freedom, less government, more choice. And I think that countries need to uh, be in a position to compete against each other uh, on tax levels, on uh, attractiveness of living in terms of, you know, whatever, uh, health care, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I tend to see these, you know, massive treaties as problematic. Um, you know, for example, the TPP thing, I mean, so what, everybody's agreeing to some common uh, regulatory structure imposed on them, probably a, a high cost thing. And I suspect the real winners down the road will be the ones who are not involved, you know, in these large <laughs> these large treaties. Uh, uh, the, 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 the coming back to that Citizenship Act, uh, uh, when we go to court, uh, usually for any civil or criminal court, there is a, a very, at least in most cases, there are very strict uh, definition of every act. Crime is this and the sentence is this and so on and so on and so on. Uh, has anyone uh, uh, attempt to make that kind of the uh, uh, definition or may state the defi definition for the say, Canadian citizenship as at all? Well, we've been to court several times, and what was very interesting is the head of the federal courts, the head justice, actually made a statement about three years ago saying, uh, we really need a test case on that very issue of citizenship and uh, I'm working with uh, some people. Uh, it looks like we're right now in the Senate level where we're going to try to define a new citizenship act because uh, you shouldn't be writing laws through the judicial process. Their job really is to interpret the constitutionality of existing law. Uh, and so anyway, one of the things we're doing in this, uh, hopefully in a new citizenship act, is we're not just trying to document it in words uh, w about what is a citizen, but we are trying to go through and say what was the parliamentary intent of the law. So in future court challenges, which there will always be some, at least they will have a much more clear-cut idea of the intent of parliament. And I think John would, with his legal background, could probably expound on that just a little bit of uh, between what a law says and the intent, and geez, we're still uh, arguing what the intent was of the 47 Act, or in the United States, are arguing the intent of the Second Amendment. So, yeah, I think, I mean, yeah. if I were, if I were uh, sitting at a table and you know trying to understand and work on these problems, there's too much focus, I think, on what gives somebody citizenship, you know, born in Canada or whatnot, and not enough focus on. Uh, what are the rights of citizenship and what does it mean, uh, you know, sort of how, how you can lose it. I don't think you ought to be able to lose it uh, all that easily. So that seems to me to be uh, the key. I really do, put another way again, I really do believe that Canada needs a constitutional definition of citizenship. And, and there's, there's another question I'll hit you with right there. The definition between citizenship and nationality, where Mexico, you're born a Mexican national, and citizenship are the rights of being a, a national, but you don't get the citizenship rights till you turn uh, the age of majority. So in some ways, both the United States and Canada has that backwards, because 
if the government says um, that uh, citizenship didn't exist before 1947, well, I don't quite think they know the difference between that and nationality because nationality has existed for a long time. You know, I'll tell you, Don, uh, this is an incredibly, incredibly important issue right now in Canada for people born before 1947 because going back to, you know, I work with all these people trying to renounce U.S. citizenship. Uh, basically, if you're born a, a dual citizen, it gives you certain advantages. And I got an email from somebody fairly recently saying, well, you know, interesting, there was no such thing as Canadian citizenship prior to the Canada Citizenship Act, etc. So, you know, the, the points that you're making, I think, are extremely important in the sense that you, what you're really arguing for is a continuity of Canadian citizenship that really goes right back to whenever Canada, you know, became, you know, became a country or whatever, and that is absolutely key. I have never really understood the difference between citizenship and nationality as well as I'd like to. Uh, there are many aspects of U.S. law that are certainly uh, con that contingent on it, uh, and clearly the concept of nationality seems to me to be essential to sort of put the idea of Canadianness, the legal status of Canadianness, one way or another, that stake on the ground prior to 1947. But really, God, somebody's got to sit down and just make this one simple statute. Well, you well, see, it, it is very unlikely with the governments that we have. Here, here's one way to think about it. The 1947 Citizenship Act was, in some ways, not a Citizenship Act, but a Nationality Act, which used the word citizen and national in reverse. Canadians have citizenship rights and obligations because they are Canadian nationals and not the other way around. So the statute and law is actually backwards. And the United States has it backwards as well, but Saudi Arabia doesn't have citizens, but they're Saudi nationals. And so we've kind of gotten it backwards yeah. from the get-go, but we were uh, Canadian nationals from 1867 on. And if we didn't have citizens before 1947, then all of our 111,000 war dead, World War One and World War Two, were not citizens of Canada. Now that's quite a shocking statement. Uh, yeah. Quite obviously, you know, there were citizens before 1947. I think that the better way to put it is there have always been Canadian citizens. It's just that the first statute that uh, that that sort of laid out the principles of Canadian citizenship was in 1947. Well, actually, that's what they say, but I would disagree with that. Uh, the 1901 uh, census laid out the principles, and then in 1910, the Immigration Act actually said, these are the three areas of Canadian citizen. One was, you were a, you were a citizen because you were born on Canadian soil. Two, you were naturalized as a Canadian citizen. And three, you were a Canadian uh, or a British subject with Canadian domicile for five years. And that has been upheld in the Supreme Court even in 1946 and 1938. And that was a clear cut definition of citizen. And then uh, this is kind of an oddball one, but for Newfoundland to get into Canada, the agreement was that they would be recognized as being Canadian citizens back to date of birth or date of domicile, which means if that's true and we didn't have citizenship in the rest of Canada, that means that the Newfies Only were Newfoundland. Canada's first citizens. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, Don, we got uh, to the end of the program. Uh, we are get I'm getting the signal from our producer. First of all, thank you for, uh, for all of this information, and I am looking forward to see you in person when you are in Toronto. You said you, you will be here around March? I'll be in mid-March. I'm speaking at the University of Toronto, and I'm doing a little book tour through some of the areas. So, Devin, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We, will you will you please uh, inform me in advance so I can book the studio time for you to be here and uh, we go in f further details about this uh, matter? Thank you. I, I will. And uh, I think John and I both have the same objective here is we need uh, some really easy legislation that 
that makes it clear who is and who is not a citizen of Canada. Be believe it or not, most people live in Canada, whether or not you consider them citizen or not, they they li they like to have them, but uh, they can't achieve that. Uh, they keep changing the government between the parties. <laughs> and and lastly, I'll just say that I'm going to be uh, speaking in Ottawa on February 24th. There's a conference. Uh, involved with the United Nations on statelessness and Canada has a huge stateless problem and it's under the radar people don't realize it but we'll be in Ottawa uh, February 24th if you send me the link then I can uh, plug it in through this program as well perfect thank uh, you and it, uh, the book is the lost Canadians by Don Chapman which I recommend for anyone who has either uh, this kind of problem or who knows anyone who has this kind of the problem or they foresee this kind of the problem coming their way uh, to read that uh, as per John. I yeah, haven't absolutely. Read that. Uh, let, John me, let me do a plug for the book. Yeah. I haven't read the whole thing, yeah, but, but it is John fascinating. John read more, much more than uh, it is fascinating. I do. Uh, you, you. By the way, you can get a. Uh, I saw you can get on Indigo the ebook version, very inexpensively, ten dollars or something. That's, that's great. Thank you, John, for being here. Thank you, Don, for being here. Thank you. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, this was our program for this uh, Tuesday, second of the uh, February, two thousand sixteen. As I remind at the end of the program, please take part in your the electoral process, which is the only thing of the democracy or left of democracy as I see it. Uh, help. Uh, your candidates volunteer, uh, donate if uh, someone is doing something good or acting something good for you. Talk and write and communicate with your uh, representatives in every level of the government. And more importantly, the next time around when we have an election, roll up your sleeves and become a candidate yourselves. Good night. Cast your ballot, hope for the best. This is where your votes rest. Oh, what we gonna do? Democracy, is it just a joke? Oscar Wilde said it best when he wrote simply, bludgeon of the people by the people for the people. Divide and conquer, well that sometimes works You can always find some sad soul who's been hurt to Turn into a radical in the name of the Lord So let the voters echo Let their voices be heard Let us join together For a peaceful and better world a place for everyone to have the say. Let the voters echo out today. Let the voters echo loud and free. So let the voters echo. Let their voices be heard. Let us join together for a peaceful and better world. A place for everyone to have the say. Let the voters echo out today. Let the voters echo loud and free. Yeah, let the voters.